Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Hogan, Program Manager of the Common Ground Initiative at the Howenstein Center. And I'd like to welcome you to today's Common Ground panel discussion titled Election Year 2014. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Grand Valley State University, our donors, especially Ralph Howenstein, and in particular, the Political Science Department at Grand Valley for generously co-sponsoring today's event. Today's panel discussion is part of the Howenstein Center's Common Ground Initiative which offers a balanced, comprehensive exploration and redefinition of what it means to be conservative and progressive today. Our aim is to cultivate an open, honest, and intellectually rigorous forum for political leaders, thought leaders, and public intellectuals from the left and right to find actionable common ground in politics. Importantly, a major focus, as I said, of the Common Ground Initiative is on politics. Our initiative began in earnest around the time of the federal government shutdown in 2013, and even before then, a main aim of the Hauenstein Center has been to promote principal pluralism in politics, academia, and beyond. So to kick off this election year, we at the Hauenstein Center are pleased to host five political science professors from Grand Valley, Paul Cornish, Whit Kilburn, Don Zinman, Erica King, and Roger Moyles, who will be discussing the coming November elections for state governor and the US House and Senate. They'll talk about some of the main issues in each campaign, but also shed light on some potential areas for and obstacles to common ground in the coming years. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to Professor Cornish, who will be our moderator today. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was uh, you know, joking with Erica this afternoon that you know, for the Common Ground Initiative, probably the middle of a very heated midterm campaign is not the best time to be looking for common ground. But I think that the way that our political scientists will address the election uh, might give you some ideas about uh, how we can think about moving forward uh, together, uh, which we must. And uh, with that, I'm just going to uh, turn the microphone over to the panel. Uh, and the panelists know what order they're going to be working in, so I'll just step out of the step out of the picture and reappear when it comes time for questions at the end of the presentations. Right. Uh, and first is Don Zinman. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here, and I hope everybody is uh, equally as enthusiastic about turning out to vote in November, or at least sending in your absentee ballot. Um, what I wanted to talk about in the uh, time that I have is um, sort of the, the recurrent historical pattern that, that takes place in midterm elections. And when we talk about midterm elections, we are talking about um, non-presidential year elections, typically associated with congressional elections, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about here today. Uh, but also uh, gubernatorial elections where you, you have, uh, I think, 34 states with gubernatorial elections and almost every state with their state legislature up for um, re-election as well as uh, various other statewide offices. And uh, I think we all know that the voter turnout in these uh, so-called midterm election years definitely is uh, lower than the levels that we get in presidential uh, uh, election years. It's also relatively well known that the president's party uh, almost always loses seats in Congress in a midterm election year. Uh, that is a, a fairly common um, recurrent historical pattern that actually goes back well into the, the 19th century uh, for the president's party to uh, just not do as well as the opposition party, and the opposition party can typically expect to make gains in uh, a midterm uh, election year. Uh, sometimes it's just a question of how big those gains are uh, going to be. In particular, though, if we want to really unpack this, what we, what we tend to see is that in the sixth year of uh, the same party holding the presidency, there tends to be an especially pronounced um, decline in the president's party in, in uh, especially pronounced decline 
with the president's party in the elections. That is to say, the president's party can lose still more seats in, uh, in the sixth year of, of an incumbent presidency or uh, after six years of the same party controlling the presidency, a phenomenon that a lot of political scientists call the sixth year itch. And there's a lot of reasons for this which have been studied at length by various political scientists uh, as to why this takes place, why, is, is, uh, why are the midterm elections in the sixth year of a two-term presidency so much worse for the president's party than perhaps the, um, uh, the second year of, of what will be a two-term presidency. Uh, and I've taken data here going all the way back to Woodrow Wilson's presidency uh, that is to say, when we had popular election, starting with when we had popular election of, of U.S. senators, uh, we could go back even farther than this if we wanted to, to and just look at House races. Um, but the pattern is pretty persistent that you can see here, which is um, Woodrow Wilson uh, uh, lost quite a few seats in, uh, in, in both chambers of, of, of Congress. Um, Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats, this was really the first time they, they suffered some pretty big election losses since Roosevelt's ascendancy to uh, the White House. They lost 71 seats in, in the House in 1938. Uh, jumping ahead here to 1974, um, Gerald Ford had just taken over from Richard Nixon after uh, uh, he was chased out of office due to Watergate. And uh, Gerald Ford uh, pardoned Mr. Nixon uh, only two months before the congressional elections, which I've always thought was a relatively unwise uh, decision politically that maybe should have waited until after the election to issue the pardon. In any case, the Republicans really took it on the chin uh, that year in, uh, in the congressional elections, and the Democrats padded their already very large majorities uh, in the Congress. Um, an interesting exception to this trend was in 1998, and most of you probably weren't, uh, either weren't alive or paying attention to much politics in 1998. The country was, was thick in the middle of the Monica Lewinsky ordeal, of which I will not explain the details here today, because this, this is a family event. Uh, but the, the country's reaction uh, to the Republican pursuit of, of uh, Mr. Clinton's peccadilloes and Ken Starr's very aggressive uh, investigation uh, upon him was very negative. And the economy, uh, some of you may not be able to remember this, the economy was doing amazingly well in 1998. I mean, just gangbusters. Uh, I had friends getting out of college with just multiple job offers, six figures, it was amazing. And I went to graduate school. But um, in any case, uh, there the Democrats defied history uh, and then in 2006, the pattern reemerged once again when uh, George W. Bush and the Republicans lost control of both chambers. And oh, it flipped off. There we go. Okay. So um, why, did, why does this tend to happen? There's a lot of reasons for this. Number one, um, problems tend to build up over the course of a two-term presidency. The problems build up, and they build up, and they build up. And that responsibility, that political responsibility, falls upon the incumbent and the incumbent's party. That is to say, uh, it becomes harder for the incumbent, whoever the president is, uh, to deflect blame upon the previous administration. The longer your party is there holding power, the more you and your party uh, assume the political responsibility for uh, the problems that befall the country. So you assume more and more ownership of the problems that uh, that befall the, uh, uh, the nation. In 2012, uh, Mr. Obama could say that, you know, it's going to take a long time for this economy to recover. We inherited a major disaster. Uh, people were receptive to that message. At least enough people were. In 2014, it gets harder to make that argument. Secondly, scandals can mount. Over the course of a two-term presidency, uh, 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 scandals can can tend to uh, uh, mount up. They may not even be scandals that the president is directly involved with, but the president's party can, can, um, can pay the price. Um, the examples you know, uh, here, I mean, you've, you've got um, in the Truman administration, the scandals were starting to, to mount up in the State Department and the IRS. Um, uh, Nixon and Watergate, need I say more? Uh, in the uh, Clinton administration, you had the Monica Lewinsky uh, uh, ordeal. 
So the um, uh, multiplication of scandals can also tend to be a real problem for a, a two-term presidency that can often come home to roost in a midterm uh, cycle. Third, uh, presidents and their administrations can, in effect, be sort of out or, or past their prime. By the time we get to the sixth year, uh, they're sort of past their prime. Uh, that is to say, the vigor of their earlier years is gone. Presidents will tend to be more reactive rather than proactive to domestic political events and, and crises. Uh, presidents will see that their legislative agendas by their sixth year are either dead or um, stalled in Congress or already enacted into law. In other words, there's not much left to, uh, uh, to do. So a lot of that energy and vigor that presidents bring with them into office that may even last, you know, uh, shortly past their reelection is largely gone by the time we get to uh, the second term. And that can oftentimes be reflected or, or, or uh, consequence of that can be uh, declining enthusiasm from the president's uh, uh, party and, the, and the, the, the voters that uh, the president's party uh, is depending upon. So you're going to see a, a lower level of enthusiasm from the um, voters who make up the political base of the president's party and uh, a much higher level of, of energy, enthusiasm, vigor, anger, whatever you want to call it, uh, that will exist within among the voters of the opposition party. Uh, the one caveat to this, though, one way that uh, the six-year itch can be overcome or, or mitigated uh, such that at least the losses in, in Congress aren't so bad is if the economy is doing extremely well. Um, and 1998 certainly presents the, um, uh, certainly presents the, the, the best e example of that, of um, you know, just a, a roaring economy that was, that was you know, outperforming you know, even the most optimistic person's expectations. Uh, when you have conditions on the ground like that, then that can certainly mitigate uh, or reduce the losses that the president's party may be experiencing. Uh, most people will agree the economy today is, is in better shape than it was six years ago or even two years ago, but the, uh, uh, people hardly feel as, as happy and confident and, as opt and optimistic about the economy as they did in uh, 1998. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists and uh, take your questions on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Whit Kilburn, and I've been asked to say a few words about public opinion. And so I thought I would keep my remarks brief to save time for questions and perhaps raise a couple issues we might discuss. Uh, and so one of the things that I think is very interesting about public opinion or measuring public opinion at the state level is that this current election is probably one of the first elections in which the traditional method of measuring public opinion through opinion polls is breaking down. So the usual method is uh, uh, doing random digit dial polls uh, or samples of landline telephones. And so you might ask yourselves, what percentage of Michigan households only have a cell phone? Anyone have any idea? A percentage? It's, it's 40 percent. 40 percent of Michigan households are cell phone only. So in most opinion polls that are reported in the papers, uh, these are the cheaper polls that are robo polls of landline phones. And some are even uh, adjusted so that they're sampling equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. And there's no reason even then to assume that it's going to be equal Republicans and Democrats uh, showing up to vote in November. So the question is whether these polls are all, or uh, the questions are uh, what the um, implications might be of these polls excluding cell phone only households. And one possibly is that they're undercounting Democratic Party support by excluding people who are younger, who are poorer, and who are more likely to rent rather than own a home. Now, does that mean that the final election result might be way off what the polls are predicting? I mean, it's, it's possible, uh, but at the same time, the electorate that turns out for midterm elections tends to be skewed in favor of Republican Party support anyways, tending, uh, tending to be um, demographically older and wider. So perhaps this is something we could uh, talk about. A second one, which is related to um, public opinion, is just the idea of where we think the 
ideological mood is of the average Michigan voter. Are Michiganders in a mood for more government services or less? And if they want more, are they willing to, to pay for more? One of the interesting things I think about the Snyder shower race is that uh, if you compare Michigan to other states in which there's a Republican running for uh, re-election against a close Democratic challenger, and so you look at states like uh, Wisconsin, Kansas, Florida, um, these are all states where it's possible that the reason why the Democratic challenger might be in a position to unseat an incumbent governor is that the administration, the incumbent administration, has run and successfully uh, run on a platform of scaling back government services and cutting taxes to the point that this could be further back than where most voters in the state would like it to be. And so I think if you look at the Schauer-Snyder race, one of the reasons why Schauer is running so competitively, perhaps, is that he's promising to restore a lot of the cuts that Snyder has made over the past few years. So schools are a big issue in Michigan, one that I think you know a few years ago people might not have expected to have as much traction as it seems to, uh, and to be emphasized so much in uh, Shower's ads, and the other one, of course, roads. So I think just this basic issue of you know where the where um, ideologically Michigan voters are now in terms of wanting more government services or less is perhaps something we could talk about. So. Good afternoon. My name is Erica King, and I'm particularly interested in campaigns and elections from the perspective of the role that media organizations play. And what I'd like to do is paint a little scenario for you to begin with. And that is, picture yourself this past weekend, kicking back in a time of just enjoying yourself perfectly, perhaps watching a football game, or watching your favorite news program, or other program on television. Suddenly, the screen darkens, and what you see is a foreboding landscape. It is dark, it is ugly. The wind is swirling, a deep announcer's voice comes on, and in a voice of doom almost, talks about the environmental pollution that is affecting Michigan. The vision that you see on the television is of coils of smoke circulating through very drab looking poor communities. And the smoke goes both outside and then it goes inside. Then you see darkened faces come on the screen. And again, in this voice of doom, the announcer says, Terry Lynn Land supported by the billionaire Koch brothers, trying to ruin Michigan's environment and Michigan's economy. Your mood may, in fact, now not be quite so joyous, or perhaps you did what the majority of Americans do at this point, and that is probably not even to be paying attention to this. But what we're discovering in Michigan and throughout approximately 10 states in the United States is that there are very close races going on, very competitive races for the US Senate. One way of all of us determining how competitive the campaigns, the candidates, and the outside groups that support or go against these candidates believe a particular race is, is to look at the number of negative advertisements that appear on television. What is intriguing is that still in this day and age where we think of ourselves as beyond the traditional television world of three networks and now some cable stations and everybody has their beautiful handheld devices, the largest amount of campaign funding by the candidates themselves, by the party organizations, and by outside groups remains on television advertisements. Those usually now 30 or, believe it or not, 31 second ads that are played over and over again. 
the more competitive the race, and although I'll be talking today about the, uh, the, the Senate race, it also applies to gubernatorial and other races as well. But the general rule of thumb, if you want to think about how competitive a race is from the perspective of the professionals running the contests, is to look at the number of negative advertisements, often deeply negative advertisements, how frequently they run, and how increasingly negative they become. What will be of interest for me for the state of Michigan senatorial race is to see, in fact, just how frequent these ads become and how negative they become because Michigan is one of the 10 states or so that the professionals have designated as a highly competitive race for the U.S. Senate. There are 36 states this fall that will be having Senate races. So we can say uh, 26 of them are not considered competitive. Now, times change, something can happen, but at the moment, only 10 races or so are considered highly competitive. Michigan is on the sort of lower level of that tier of 10 competitive states. Will it remain competitive? Again, we can judge this partially on the advertisements. So far, what I see is a lot of money being spent in this state by outside groups. And I think the real key to measuring competitiveness is neither the candidates' ads nor the political party ads, but the ads presented by outside organizations. And the reason for this is that these outside groups, advocacy groups, have now, by federal law, the ability to raise unlimited amounts of funds and spend unlimited amounts of money, both before, for certain candidates and against certain candidates. And the more competitive the race becomes, the greater the likelihood of negative attacks. So it gives us all something to look forward to. The big, if you are like me and somebody who actually, perhaps I am an outlier, I live for the election advertising season. I live for this because I think that these little ads, these 30 second ads, tell us something very intriguing about our society and our political culture at any given point in time. So that the issues that they raise tell us something about the wider society, both nationally in terms of the Senate and internationally. So one of the things I'm going to be looking for, for example, is the role of international issues. Because for the Senate, you're focused not just on the nation itself, but senators play a very key role on the international scene. We know that Obama, and with congressional approval, is upping the stakes in Syria and Iraq against ISIS. To what extent is that going to become an issue that is going to affect the public? Watch the ads. Because the ads will tell you, again, what the professionals think the most important issues will be. Or, on the other hand, is, are we going to discover, for example, in Michigan, that issues of the economy, or immigration, or Obamacare, which, by the way, a lot of the political professionals thought would be a big defining ad for Senate races in 2014. I'm not so sure that's going to be the case. Again, we get for the next six weeks to stay tuned and watch this. So that's just my, my little set of ideas to give you a little bit of a lead about what's going on in the races. Look for the issues, look for the ads, look for the level of negativity. One other aspect, though, of media and campaigns that I want to mention is the unpaid or free media coverage that's given by our mass media outlets. Here's another clue. To what extent does our national, or do our national media organizations pay attention 
to different Senate races. If, in fact, the national media believe that Michigan will play a key role in determining which party will control the Senate in 2014, you're going to get a lot of media coverage in outlets like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the three television networks, and the three cable news networks. If Michigan is highlighted there, that means that the journalism professionals believe that Michigan may, in fact, be one of the states that will either tilt the Senate to Republican hands or allow the Senate to remain in Democratic hands. Although my colleague, Professor Zinman, mentions that in the sixth year of a two-term presidency, the president's party tends to lose seats in Congress, the Republicans need a net gain of only six seats to recapture the Senate. And so there's a huge amount of attention being put on this by the national media because the Senate race in particular this year fulfills the criteria, the three criteria of journalistic attention. And that is excitement, drama, and personal conflict. And the states in which we have the most of that will be the ones that the media have determined are the critical states. Will Michigan be one of those states? My guess is yes. My guess is that we will get our fill, again, not just of paid advertising, but also of media coverage. I think it is going to be an opportunity for all of us in this state to get to sit back, we hope at the end participate, but observe a very fascinating and important campaign mm -hmm. in action. My best prognosis is the, cam the Senate campaign in Michigan is going to become increasingly negative unless there is, an, and increasingly covered by the national media, unless it becomes apparent in all of the public opinion polls, my uh, colleague Whit Kilburn was just uh, talking about, unless the gap between the two candidates widen. So I leave you all with the words of the inimitable screen actress Betty Davis, quote, fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Uh, I'm Roger Moyles, and I teach state politics here at uh, Grand Valley. And uh, so, so much of what my colleagues have been talking about really applies to this race, and, and uh, sometimes very directly. Um, you know, we have in this corner, we have Governor Rick Snyder, the incumbent, um, the, uh, the guy that identified himself as one tough nerd. He emerged on the scene four years ago uh, with the Super Bowl ads uh, in, in the local markets and uh, really uh, came out of nowhere because he had been a business executive. He had been the chairman of uh, the board of uh, Gateway Computers uh, and, uh, uh, and a venture capitalist. Uh, and as we now hear, he describes himself as an accountant, uh, which is partly, you know, where he came from. But uh, he won election with an 18% margin, which nobody had, had done. Nobody had uh, won election as a, as a non-incumbent since 1946 in Michigan with that large of a margin. Um, on the other hand, you've got, in the other corner, you've got Mark Schauer, and Mark Schauer has served as, uh, in the, the Michigan House in the late 1990s during the Engler administration. Uh, he served uh, in the Michigan Senate for six years, the last two years being uh, the minority leader uh, in, during the Granholm administration. Uh, and then he ran for the U.S. House and won. He defeated an incumbent. Uh, he comes out of the 7th District in uh, Battle Creek, and uh, he defeated an incumbent, and then two years later that incumbent came back and defeated him in his reelection bid. Uh, so we have these two, uh, you know, really kind of different candidates there, uh, and here we are in a position where it's a toss-up race, right? Uh, you look at the polls over the last month, in particular, out of nine polls that have been reported, uh, in all of those, uh, the difference between the candidates is within the margin of error. 
You have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt here too because when we talk about the, these polls, these statewide polls, in many cases they're using a smaller sample, five or 600 Michigan residents. And so the margin of error tends to be a little bit larger. It's gonna be more like plus or minus 4% or 5% uh, in these cases. Um, and one of the problems we have too is that we don't have access to a lot of the breakdown to find out who it is that's supporting uh, which candidate, what characteristics they have. Most of that stuff is, is not really reported to us. and We just get the big numbers that, uh, that you hear about. Um, but we do look at, at a few things, and Epic MRA is a pretty good pollster for this, and they provide a little bit more of that breakdown, and we can we get a little bit of a sense of how this, uh, this toss-up is really shaping up. Um, and, uh, you know, just to give you a little bit of a perspective here, uh, no first-term incumbent governor in Michigan has lost re-election. And so here we are six weeks today away from this election, and they're in a statistical dead heat. Uh, and that's, it's not that that's unprecedented, but it is something that uh, shows uh, how this has come along. Uh, but in Epic's poll from uh, uh, about a month ago, uh, they showed Shower with a two-point edge, statistically a dead heat, but a two-point edge, 45 to 43 over Snyder. Um, and, and that was improving upon about, oh, about eight or ten months ago when Mark Shower uh, was trailing by 8%. And what's really significant there, I think, is the fact that in February, 54% of uh, people in that sample didn't know the name Mark Schauer. They just didn't recognize him because apart from his congressional district of about 700,000 in the Battle Creek to uh, kind of up toward Lansing area, uh, unless you were politically active and had been following Michigan politics and knew of him as the, the Senate minority leader, uh, you probably didn't know his name. And so he's been able to cut into that. And he's, uh, Shower's been able to drop the number of people who uh, don't recognize his name down. Uh, it dropped down by May to about 41%, and then a month ago it was 29%. And uh, presumably with the, uh, the latest polling, we're expecting another one and the breakdowns from Epic probably in the next week or so. Uh, he, he, I'm sure with these ads that people at least know his name now, uh, and that helps. But it gives us a, a moment to think about what, what does this really tell us? If the governor is in this battle to hold on to his seat there, and he's in a position against a candidate where three out of ten uh, people, three out of ten likely voters, don't recognize the opponent's name, then that suggests that there's more of this, uh, that, that there's more of the uh, trending here against Snyder rather than for Shower. So that Mark Schauer is getting his message out there, but at the same time, uh, that it's more a reflection that people are, are going for the candidate who is running against Snyder rather than going for uh, Mark Schauer necessarily uh, in particular. Uh, Governor Snyder's favorable ratings uh, are, are currently around 45%. For an incumbent six weeks away from an election, to not be over 50% can be a real problem for that candidate. Uh, Mark Showers, however, has, have been as low as 26% because he simply didn't have the sort, same sort of name recognition out there. And so, uh, you know, that's something that, that uh, they each have, have their own challenges really to overcome. Um, <clears throat> There are a couple of key factors that my colleagues have, have mentioned about here in particular. Pro Professor King just a moment ago talking about the role of money. Um, Rick Snyder has a big advantage in terms of the, his own campaign's funds. Uh, he's raised about twice as much as Mark Schauer has been able to raise. Uh, about uh, a total of uh, almost 10 million for Snyder and about 4.6 million for Mark Schauer. And one of the things that that does is uh, as Professor King was saying, those negative ads can come from those outside groups. The candidates like to run the more positive ads about themselves and what they want to do. Uh, and going into this last month and a half or so, it actually gives a benefit to Governor Snyder to be able to present more of those positive image ads uh, and leave uh, you know, any sort of the attack ads to some of those outside groups there. Uh, and so that's something. The fact, though, that this is a close race means that there may be more of an injection of money uh, into the campaign. There may be more coming from other parts of the country into that race. Uh, and so it is something that, uh, you know, we'll see how that plays out. We'll see where that outside money comes from. 
Uh, a lot of the money in the governor's race, or a lot of the, the ads coming from outside have come from the Republican Governors Association attacking Mark Schauer, associating him with former Governor Jennifer Granholm. Uh, on the other side, you've got the Democratic Governors Association attacking Governor Snyder for policies like right to work or cuts to education, that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll see how much they step up uh, uh, that. Another key issue in Michigan will be turnout. We have two big races at the top of the ticket. As, as uh, Professor Zinwin was saying just a, a little bit ago about turnout in these elections, uh, midterm elections, uh, they're lower. And, but you do have a governor's race, you have the Senate race, uh, and so it should draw out voters. Particular issues out there, right to work energizes union voters, so that uh, helps shower. Uh, you also have uh, some differences in Detroit in particular uh, in the last month or so when you look at things there were uh, there's sometimes a reaction to some issues that came up during the bankruptcy proceeding in Detroit and also some issues that uh, would arise over reaction to the the flooding that took place recently and, and the state's uh, role in trying to to uh, remediate that uh, so you have those kinds of things there. If Democrats turn out to vote for Shower, it means he's, he certainly has a better chance here. Um, but it's, it's going to be one of those key things with uh, President Obama's approval rating lower. You're not seeing him out there stumping for Mark Shower in the state. Uh, you're seeing, you know, on Labor Day, we saw uh, Joe Biden, which he's been doing regularly in Michigan, coming to Detroit. Uh, but, uh, but you're not seeing, you know, the real push from the White House that can help. Uh, instead, they're probably asking the president to stay uh, a little bit in the background in this race. Um, the, another issue that's come up recently has been about the debates, uh, the potential for debates. And, uh, you know, it's typical for an incumbent to not want to debate. Uh, it gives their opponent uh, a forum. Uh, it puts them on an equal footing out there and presents that, that face. If Mark Schauer is still trying to get his name familiar enough to the voters, then the last thing an incumbent might want to do would be to... Uh, uh, you know, give that, that sort of a forum to them. But they have decided in the last couple of days that uh, they've come to an agreement to have at least one debate, a town hall meeting uh, in October, and it'll be moderated, but questions from the audience. And so at least we're gonna have some point where they're face to face and be able to confront each other on policy issues and matters uh, that are important. Uh, and this is something that we also, you know, we've been seeing in the Senate race that there's been a reluctance um, to, uh, uh, to, to agree to some of these debates, uh, at least on one side of it. So it's a matter that to be able to come forward here uh, as voters, we, I think we deserve to be able to hear from the candidates and to be able to compare them and talk about the issues that are important. And uh, I'd like to see, one of the things that I think is important is to see the media step into this more with uh, you know, scheduling periods that there's going to be an hour block every election, and no matter whether there's an incumbent uh, or which party has, has any uh, uh, seats to defend, that they set aside a time and they say, we've got this time and we'd like you to debate, and if you, you know, whichever one shows up or both of you show up, we'll give you the time, but that way somebody can't duck out of debates, and I think it's very important that we have that. Uh, and it's not something that we can force by legislation uh, upon the candidates, but I think there is a way that the media can uh, play a, a much more substantial role in this. So uh, th there are key issues that, that certainly they have to debate, things like roads and education, what it should be, and uh, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to that kind of thing, but uh, ultimately it's, uh, uh, you know, this is what we as voters need to expect. We need to be able to demand that we hear some answers to these things. So I'll turn it back then, thank you. I will now uh, take, uh, take your questions and to direct, you know, you can direct them to whichever people on the panel you'd like, and I'll come by with the microphone so that you can speak into the microphone. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, I see. Um, in the latest poll uh, with the land, uh, the Terry Land race, it showed her six to eight points behind in West Michigan. Is there any factors or that would explain that in your guys' opinion? Or and how does that uh, going forward uh, coming to the election does that have any bearing? Is that is that number in, uh, a good indicator of what should happen or what we should expect from West Michigan? 
for uh, in the election? I thought, you were, uh, I thought you were going to take it first, but I would say that uh, I think whenever you see these statistics quoted, it really is essential to ask what are the details of how the polls were collected. And MILive.com, uh, they, uh, not to pick on them, uh, but they do uh, run feature stories on polls that are taken, uh, that are robocall automated polls of landline only phones, and, and sometimes there are polls that are sponsored by consultants or media groups where the sample is drawn to make the race look uh, competitive or the sample is drawn so that it motivates the work that the consultant is doing in attempting to figure out among competing groups of Republicans and Democrats, you know, who, um, uh, which candidate they support. But uh, in, uh, which poll was, uh, was this that you were? Uh, Mitchell Research and Communication. Yeah, I mean, uh, just at first glance, to me, this seems like one of the polls that, without further details, is probably suspect. I would find it surprising that she would be running behind in West Michigan. I think if, I think what we need to do with polling is not just to look at a single poll, but to look at, as you know very well, because you're one of the people in my class, uh, to, to look at polls in the aggregate. And this, I think, is the best measure of polls, because we're taking so many of them now to see if they're all pointing in the same direction. However, that could be an indication where the professionals would say, there may be a problem here for a candidate, because you would think, in terms of the geography of Michigan, this would be the area where there would be more support. So I think the outside groups then trying to figure out, are we going to spend a lot of money in Michigan on the Senate race? they might start looking at this kind of poll to say, is one candidate going to be lagging? And if so, it's not so competitive. We pull our money out of here and we go to a more competitive state. We've still got six weeks to go, but I think that's part of the constant updating of political data, political information that the professionals look for now at this point on a daily basis. Yeah, I'd like to add to the, uh when you look at these uh, estimates, if, if they're reporting that Terry Lynn Land is at this percent and you look at what uh, Peters is at, uh, you, you also have to take that margin of error on each of them. And so that range, that if it's plus or minus 4 percent, then you might actually have a range that's 8 percent. So that you, you could actually have it in that case in West Michigan that, uh, in fact, Terry Lynn Land was ahead. Uh, in reality, but is not, uh, uh, it's not showing up. There's a statistical anomaly there. Uh, but as still, even then, if it was tied in West Michigan, we'd still ask those questions. Why would it be only tied for Terry Land from this area? Uh, and it would raise that. But as, as a statistical matter, you, you really have to look plus or minus 4% on each of theirs, which really makes it maybe an 8% range. Or if it's a 5% plus or minus, it's going to be 10%. And that doesn't tell us a whole lot then, does it? So that's part of the problem of polls. Yes. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank each of you for some really insightful and incisive comments. My question has to do with our audience. How engaged do you think students are this particular election? How does their engagement compare to other midterm elections where students have had the opportunity to vote? And what do you do to increase engagement? Well, I've seen no evidence in this particular campaign, uh, early as it may be, uh, I've seen no evidence in this particular midterm election cycle that uh, students or people of the 18 to 24 year old age bracket are, are especially or unusually more uh, engaged. Um, the phenomenon that's kind of interesting here is that in the last several election cycles, Democrats have done exceptionally well with, with younger voters in the 18 to 29 year old uh, uh, bracket. We started to see that happening in 2004 and, and then again you know, to a much greater degree in 2008 and 2012. Uh, and that's great for Democrats in presidential election cycles. Uh, they, they do marvelously well in, in, uh, uh, with, that, with that age group in presidential election cycles. And, uh, uh, with a lot of hard work, uh, uh, 
uh, Barack Obama got a, a pretty respectable turnout amongst that uh, age bracket. Uh, but because uh, so much of uh, his winning coalition, the Democratic Party's winning coalition, depends upon younger voters, um, that's a problem in non-presidential election cycles. Unfortunately, there is a substantial number of, of Americans, uh, including many uh, young people uh, between 18 and 24 who do not seem to think that non-presidential election years are important, who seem to believe that the only elections that are really worth their time are uh, presidential elections and other elections are just, you know, unimportant uh, or unserious. Now, as for the people specifically in this room, I would suspect or hypothesize that the people in this room are probably more engaged than the average um, uh, citizen of uh, 18 to 24 years old because, in fact, you've all chosen to be here this, this afternoon. Uh, and one thing that, that often does not get a lot of attention, a, a lot of um, d d discussion is used up in talking about college students voting and, and, you know, will they turn out or why don't they turn out. Uh, and that's all fine and good, but a lot of times what people don't talk about are the, the um, uh, eligible voters between 18 and 25 years old who do not go to college. Uh, and in fact, their, their rates of voter turnout are, are even uh, lower than that of 18 to 25 year olds who, uh, who, who do attend or do continue their, their education. That doesn't really tend to get talked about very much is the non-college cohort of 18 to 25 year olds, and, and, I, and including among people in our profession. Um, so I'll just pass it on here. <laughs> Just one final point, and that is these, as Don Zinman said, these off-year elections pose challenges to Democrats. And one of the things the party leaders and those individuals who advocate for the Democratic point of view, Democratic Party point of view, know they have to work extra hard on their what's called GOTV, get out the vote initiatives in an off-year election. And this is a, a source of great concern. What is interesting and will be interesting to observe is the extent to which in Michigan and in other states, the very high-tech campaigning techniques that are now being used with getting voter lists, and not just lists of voters who are registered, but lists that contain extremely detailed information about each individual, and believe me, every individual has these kinds of pieces of information available about them, where the people who are the candidates themselves or their staffs and the political party operatives and the outside groups are all trying to figure out what is that secret or maybe they hope not quite so secret or secret just to them way of targeting specific voters that will induce their supporters to come to the polls. And we're getting more refined, more uh, creative ways of reaching these voters. What's interesting to me is actually getting these voters who are identified, who are reached, segmented, and identified is one thing. That's the high-tech world of campaigning. The shoe-leather, low-tech world of campaigning is doing personal contacts with those people, trying often to do it in a face-to-face -face method, getting them out to vote. That's the big trick in off-year elections. Any, another question? I don't need a mic. I, I read in the journal the other day that the more conservative people had been outspent by the liberal people in the ads. I think like 58 million had been spent by the what we would call a progressive side, and like 30 some percent, 30 some million was spent by the conservatives. And my liberal friends, of course, you say Koch brothers, and they have a fit. And uh, I was just surprised that the numbers were that way. And given your experience, I was interested in your prognosis. So this, we're only six weeks away from it. Do you expect now we'll see that the big money comes in from those that have the big money? Absolutely. And I think it is going to be targeted very much because the groups that have the big money care 
passionately about political issues. What's very interesting is for a political party, you're thinking about a coalition, you're thinking about multiple issues, you're thinking about the coalition it takes for your party to win. Outside advocacy organizations are thinking about their particular issues, and that's what they care about, and they have the highly paid, highly competent professionals, just as the parties and campaign organizations do, to be able to say, which are the candidates and the campaigns that we should target? How is our money best going to be spent? And as I say, I don't think we've begun to see the big money being unleashed yet. Could I just ask another question uh, of you as well and the audience? Isn't this sort of the strange new world of campaigns that we're in where a Senate election could be held and most of the campaigns and advertising, or at least a huge share of it, could be spent entirely by groups uh, not affiliated with the campaigns themselves and the issues develop the themes, the agendas developed by outside groups. It's this is a tremendous phenomenon, and I don't think it's going to stop. But what you have in so many of these campaigns now is candidates, even with groups that support them politically and support the same issues that the candidates do, if those groups are focused solidly on that issue and that issue alone, and the candidate is trying either to downplay that issue, to get a winning coalition, or to bring in other issues. Again, the candidate loses control of the agenda, the new world of politics. Another question? The thing that surprised me the most in the Michigan Senate campaign, and that is in the sixth year of his own president's uh, two terms in office, Carl Levin decided to retire. Another question? No, I want to be here. Oh, you want to be here? <laughs> she, she was wondering if you wanted to comment too. I don't have to go on for now. Okay. <laughs> um, a couple moments ago, you, a question ago, you, you kind of came fairly close to um, you know, the whole campaign financing, and um, I guess it would be the Citizens United. What, what do you see as the next likely things happening there over the next, what, three or four or five years? Um, if I'm understanding your question correctly, one, one, uh, one issue to watch is, is of course, um, the, the precedent that's been set by, by Citizens United is, you know, a, an overall weakening of um, the federal government's ability to regulate um, campaign uh, donations to, to campaigns. Um, and with the Citizens United ruling um, coming down the way that it did, 
um, a lot of uh, organizations and, and uh, activists, uh, and not all of them on, on the right wing either, um, have uh, turned their or have targeted the existing campaign finance laws that prohibit direct donations from corporations to candidates. What Citizens United does is allow corporations, unions, and just wealthy people to uh, donate large sums of money, not to the individual candidate, but to an outside organization. Uh, it could be just an outside organization that's been created for the purposes of an election, but uh, Citizens United uh, did not affect the, the 1907 law that prohibits corporations from directly, uh, just right out of their coffers, giving money to candidates. With the Citizens United ruling coming down the way that it did four years ago, uh, there are a, a good many um, opponents of campaign finance laws in general who have set their sights on that law from 1907 when Teddy Roosevelt was president. It's called the Tillman Act that want that law thrown out as, as an unconstitutional violation of, of uh, corporations' right to free speech. And um, there, there could very well be, uh, in the near future, a, a Supreme Court case that, that, that it gets to the heart of that issue, whether or not corporations can uh, just cut out the middleman entirely and just right out of their coffers donate, you know, large sums of money uh, directly to uh, uh, to the candidate. Uh, there's also the possibility, just going down that trajectory and those that precedent, that um, individual donor limits. You know, there there are individual donor limits based upon what you or me can can donate to a candidate or to a, a political party. Those donor limits have been there for 40 years. Um, do those donor limits uh, restrict free speech? There will be uh, people, uh, including Senator McConnell, who would say yes, that those donor limits actually restri uh, restrict uh, uh, speech, that spending money in campaigns uh, constitutes uh, uh, speech. Uh, I might just add to the idea that if we look down the line, you try to predict uh, uh, you know, if there's a reaction to Citizens United, what do you do about this? Uh, you know, it's kind of a case of the fox guarding the hen house. Uh, if the Supreme Court has made this ruling, then the way to go about it is uh, essentially a constitutional amendment that, that effectively overturns that. Um, that was introduced a week or so ago in the U.S. Senate, and it, it didn't, didn't pass uh, uh, anywhere near the two-thirds majority needed. Uh, it was blocked, in fact, from even uh, coming to a, a full vote. So uh, it, it's one of those things where it's very difficult when the people on both sides who are going to benefit from this, uh, you know, if you're talking about campaign finance reform, it's very difficult to get any kind of finance reform done uh, when it's in their hands. And, uh, you know, it took until 1971 or so to get any kind of comprehensive uh, campaign finance reform. It took another, uh, you know, 30 plus years to, uh, to accomplish it with uh, McCain-Feingold, uh, any sort of reform there. And so uh, I, I think you're going to see the further escalation of the amounts of money um, and the expansion of these groups. Uh, they're spending it, and when one side is spending it, the other side's going to counter it, and it's just going to keep going up until uh, it gets to a point where saturation, where maybe d voting is completely depressed and it's not necessary to spend that. But anyway. Remember, however, that the argument in favor of <coughs> relaxing rules and regulations regarding campaign contributions does rest on the notion of freedom of speech. So I guess the question was, is it, uh, if I can summarize and tell me if this is correct, uh, the question was, is it rare generally for a party to win one statewide office and lose another? And to what extent does incumbency play a role in, uh, in this? Is that more or less correct? I mean, I think uh, certainly it's possible. I mean, uh, state uh, elections could have uh, uh, character or the 
uh, or the personal biography of the person playing uh, a role in an election or uh, candidates running for Congress can play on national issues while statewide office holders are limited to state issues, which typically are the economy. So I think, especially when we talk about the incumbency factor in statewide races, you know, pretty much one of the fundamentals is how we measure the economic conditions of the state and whether they're improving or not. And this does, I think, get to some of the interesting things that, uh, that have been discussed here, which is that, you know, uh, even in Snyder's ad about how, uh, I forget the, uh, his famous line about how uh, things could be improving, but you're, not, but you're not feeling it yet. Isn't that it, more or less? It's that, um, you know, perhaps the, uh, the, uh, the uh, unemployment rate is certainly dropping, but uh, Michigan's economy is nowhere near it was uh, back prior to the last recession. Uh, now, in most occupations, average wages in Michigan are below the national average. Employment in Michigan is back to where it was pre-recession in 1999 or 2000 or so. So I think if you look at the differences in the possibility of, say, um, a Democrat being elected to the Senate um, and possibly Snyder being reelected or maybe even Land being elected to the Senate and Shower taking the governor's office, I think a big part of that could have to do with how a voters sense the economy is doing. Um, and in the world of campaigns also, the individual candidate does make a difference. The, the campaign can make a difference. But the usual pattern then is, I think, for most of the time, especially in congressional races, the incumbent senator has an advantage or the incumbent member of Congress has an advantage. However, you know, this is what I love about academics. We can argue on the one hand, but then on the other hand. So we're always right. Uh, in the end, you get these phenomena called wave elections. And those are very interesting ones. And that's where you tend to get, and we have had 2010, recent years, some elections where things all seem to break in favor of one political party, regardless of the office that's being run for. Yes, of course, there are the outliers and the exclusions. And one of the interesting questions that the Democrats and Republicans this year have very different hopes about is to whether this will be a wave election, because the general agreement is that if it's a wave election, it'll be a wave for the Republicans. What the Democrats are hoping is, I guess with fingers in the dike, they can keep the wave from crashing over the, the barriers, an analogy that was a little tired to begin with. But I hope that makes, makes sense. So sometimes it's the context of the campaign itself. Will this be a wave election? I think the best money is no. It won't be one where the Republicans gain a huge amount in the Senate. The big question still is, will they gain those six votes? Six seats. I'm interested in, in from you and in, in any one of you, is what's the, the best argument on the free speech question? I mean, what's the, the best <laughs> legal argument, legal or otherwise, that can be made that you can put any limitation on political speech by anybody, anytime, anywhere? And, it, and, I, and I understand that Justice Holmes established that, you can't, that there are limitations on free speech and you can't holler fire in a crowded theater. But what's the argument on political speech justifies limiting it anytime, any place, any way. I could just take a quick stab at that. One, I think you have to start by questioning the assumption that money is, is practically equivalent or essential to political speech. I think it has to begin with that assumption. And I don't see how you can really work around that assumption. If you see money as basically equivalent to political speech, how do you work around that? I would say, though, that one argument could be that um, the right to free speech, it's the right to exercise free speech in support or opposition of your own candidates in your own state and not to have your voice drowned out by people from outside the state. I think it's about elections and the context, the, uh, the district and the state in which they occur and whether people should have the right to have their own verse, voice heard above that of outside groups. But whether that uh, is a good legal argument, I don't really know. But. If spending money is speech, 
if spending money is speech, does then does then that just apply to uh, the arena of political campaigns? Because then I should be able to, uh, then I could say that spending money on any consumer good uh, is uh, therefore uh, uh, must must be protected. And I can uh, uh, that the mere act of, of spending money uh, uh, constitutes freedom of speech. That it's a form of freedom of speech when I when I. Um, uh, go to the pizza place and order a pepperoni pizza. Is if, if spending if spending money constitutes uh, a speech or making a political statement, um, then does that just apply to the context of political campaigns? And I'm not sure I know how I come down myself on on uh, on that on that argument. But in the Buckley versus Vallejo uh, decision from 1976, um, you know the the supreme the Supreme Court had, had, had suggested that um, spending money is, is speech uh, and, and can be understood as such, but that the federal government has a, a compelling interest in um, having reasonable donor limits um, upon uh, the amount of money that, that individuals or organizations can um, uh, inject into an election campaign. Uh, so the the court back then didn't say didn't reject the argument that spending is speech, uh, but the court did acknowledge that there is a, a, a reasonable place for for uh, the government to regulate the um, amount of money that individuals could could inject uh, into a campaign. It's also the ruling that allowed individuals to spend unlimited amounts of their own money right. on their own campaign. Why, why can't we just? But the First Amendment doesn't guarantee us the right to equal doesn't guarantee us the right to equality of speech, or equal access to speech, or nor does the First Amendment um, guarantee us the right to be heard. The, the, there's the right to free speech, but there is not the right to be heard. We can't compel people to listen to us, uh, nor uh, is is any other actor compelled to provide us with uh, you know uh, literally a microphone or a platform upon which to uh, make our speech. So, you know, uh, Rush Limbaugh has, you know, the syndication and I think every media market in, in this country, Rush Limbaugh has uh, a heck of a lot of, of, of uh, an ability to be heard because there's a lot of people who will listen to him and hang on every word that uh, he says. But if you're an ordinary citizen, well, you know, you gotta start from the, from the bottom and, and prove that you, you uh, deserve to be heard. I, that, I'm not sure I like it, but that's the way it works. The strange understanding of equality that says that Rush Limbaugh and an ordinary non-wealthy citizen have to be treated the same because that's the definition of equality. If your definition of equality is treatment as an equal, not necessarily the same treatment, then that is still, that, that still is a, a strong understanding of equality that says you treat people differently in order to What? Okay. Yeah. I think it's an odd understanding of equality to say that we have to treat everybody the same when everybody is different. A better understanding of equality is to be treated as an equal. In other words, to be treated with equal respect. And if if it's the case that giving, treating everybody the same means that there's a vast inequality in the way people are treated as equals, then that's just inequality. It's not, and, and, it, and it, I don't really think it can be legitimated on the grounds that if you have enough money, you should have this much liberty of speech, and if you don't have that much money, you shouldn't have that much liberty of speech. May I just make a response to that? out of the realm of theory and more into the realm of practical politics, Rich. And that is, I think part of the argument here, can, you can think about it in a different way, the powers of incumbency. 
an incumbent politician has a microphone that reaches out through the media, through other kinds of channels, should a challenger then to that incumbent have the right to spend vastly more sums of money because that person doesn't have the prerogatives of office to get his or her voice heard? Um, I think that incumbency and this huge percentage of re-election isn't something that's just universal. It's not necessarily that way in other places. So, you know, should that be part of the issue as well? I guess I'm having a hard time saying what I'm thinking, but um, kind of this idea of, like, yeah, we need to justify spending exorbitant amounts of money because we have this you know, it's hard to unseat incumbents. Should we then maybe look at that issue as a whole as well as part of that greater context? One, one, issue. one issue we're not we're not addressing then if you're talking about the incumbency advantage, and I think you're implying that, that other other parliamentary democracies maybe this isn't such a phenomenon. Is that what you're suggesting? That there's not such an incumbency advantage in other countries? One thing we're not talking about here, big elephant in the room, gerrymandering. Gerrymandering. My, my, for goodness sake, um, uh, you know, politicians themselves in the state legislatures, in most states anyway, have the ability to draw the congressional district, uh, and it's he who has the gold makes the rules. It's uh, the, the party that controls a legislative chamber. Surprise, they're going to draw up the, the districts for state legislature and for, for U.S. House of Representatives that benefit their party. And what you end up doing is you have very few congressional districts that are truly competitive, where it's, it's really up for grabs, you know, swing districts. You end up with uh, congressional districts that are cozy, safe for whoever, whatever Democrat or Republican gets elected to those districts. So. Uh, what ends up happening is, uh, you know, if a, a young man or a young woman gets elected to uh, a Congress from a gerrymandered congressional district that's meant to be a Democratic district or a Republican district, then that young man or woman probably has themselves a lifetime seat in Congress, barring, you know, a horrible scandal, and sometimes even then they still survive. Um, gerrymandering, uh, the, the impact of that can't be understated. It has real consequences. And the other thing, too, is, is that when you have gerrymandering, you, you have these very ideologically extreme districts that are, you know, arch-conservative or arch-liberal, and you get what you, what you produce, and then you end up with a Congress full of uh, Alan Grayson's and a Congress full of uh, Louis Gohmert's, uh, you know, people who are there to throw rhetorical bombs and, and uh, you know, pound the table and give speeches and not much interested in actually passing legislation. <laughs> I wanted to know about uh, the question that he asked. So everyone on the panel sees the sees free speech and money connected. Well, no, I think we were just kind of summarizing what the conventional treatment is of money as political speech on the courts. I think we were just kind of expressing what the status quo is, what the situation is, not endorsing that view. I mean, I, um, does that clear? Yeah, uh, Patrice, but I didn't hear clarify? anything else. Well, um, did you, what, so you disagree? So, uh, Patrice, no, you disagree with the, uh, another, you know, another view of it. Oh. Well, I think we also heard the other view from, from Rich, which, uh, from uh, Rich Hiskey's uh, political science professor in, uh, in the audience here who raised the question that uh, this insistence on treating people equally ignores the fact that people are unequal and the insistence on it resu uh, results in magnifying the unequal condition in which people can start to express their ideas by virtue of their wealth or their access to media. Um, so, okay. 
Uh, what were uh, Snyder's biggest shortcomings as a governor, and how is Shower going to capitalize on that? Can you summarize? A good uh, so the question was, what are uh, Snyder's biggest shortcomings as governor and how would Shower capitalize on that? I was just wondering what other people in the audience thought about the idea that I uh, raised at the beginning, which was maybe the shortcoming is that Snyder is fundamentally ideologically at odds with where most Michiganders want government to be. I would say most Michiganders prefer more government and possibly even more taxes to pay for it. I think the evidence of that is that school bond uh, referendum, school um, uh, millages and support of school funding typically pass in the state and even in Kent County services for seniors for the library those passed by wide margins in counties that were Romney uh, Romney wins uh, so I wonder if one answer is that uh, through a Republican controlled legislature he's been forced to try to pull government from being too small or cutting services too much uh, and reducing taxes in support of that which is just at odds with what most Michiganders want. Oh. Um, I, I think one of the issues that the governor is going to uh, have to deal with in the next six weeks, I think one of the issues that will come up particularly in uh, their town hall debate will be about the condition of the roads. Uh, the governor has been pushing for the last three and a half years before he was elected, pushing for more state money for roads to, to, to basically leverage more federal money then coming in and transportation dollars. And he's had uh, strong Republican majorities in both the House and Senate and hasn't been able to get that done. So it's not for want of trying, but he hasn't been successful with his own majorities. That's not, if Shower's elected, that's not gonna happen either, unless you know there's some sudden wave here and Democrats win um, control or, or more seats in the state legislature. Uh, he's not going to uh, particularly, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's not gonna do any better on that, I think. But, uh, but that is something that I think the, the governor is holding some responsibility for not being able to lead with that much of an advantage in his hand. Uh, I, I think there's also the issue of education. Um, they're restructuring everything, but there are also issues about charter schools. That's a direction that they've been going in uh, with authorizing more. And the evidence is at least questionable about uh, the quality of, uh, of, of the outcomes of those. So um, I think there's more scrutiny on, on those sorts of things. Uh, I think the biggest problem that the governor is really facing in this uh, is the question about the tax disparity. Uh, you, you see what the governor did. He, he, uh, when he ran for office, he talked about reforming the tax system, but he didn't really specify how. And that, that was a strategic uh, decision they made, and it was a smart one. Uh, that he couldn't be pinned down on that at the time, but what it turned out to be was to strip away a lot of the corporate taxes and simplify it. I think it needed to be simplified, uh, but at the same time then, it, it was accompanied by uh, a tax on pensions for Michigan residents. Michigan was one of the only states in the country that didn't tax those pensions, uh, but it, it's something that makes him vulnerable then, and senior citizens, of course, are are going to be very concerned about that. And I, I think that's something there. I don't, wouldn't anticipate that Mark Schauer is going to try to repeal that, and I don't think he's going to be able to do that. Um, but I think that is something that uh, he's going to stand vulnerable on. Okay. We have a question over here, but we are reaching the end of our period. So uh, I, I know Roger might have to go to class. Yeah. So, yeah. So in the four years that uh, Snyder has been in office, there have been a lot of social issues that have taken even national stage in Michigan. You know, access to women's health care, um, uh, same-sex marriage has come up, and the courts have ruled on it. But you all haven't talked about social issues. You did mention that economic issues tend to rule the day in state elections. Do you see that social issues ever play a role in state elections? Do they not play as much of a role you know, this year for some reason? Yeah, we'll let the native Californian take that question first. That's, that's me. Uh, you can tell by my California accent. Um, in, in my state, growing up, uh, I, I can remember a lot of statewide uh, elections where social issues were extremely important, sometimes eclipsing economic issues. Um, one memory that still sticks out with me quite a bit is uh, Governor Pete Wilson, uh, who uh, uh, was very good at, at, at pushing voters' buttons uh, on hot button, hot blooded issues, you know, crime, welfare, and illegal immigration. You know, constantly, you know, brought up those issues, you know, to 
you know, really push people's buttons. Um, and in 1994, he um, made a big thing about uh, illegal immigration in, in the state of California uh, and ran what I think to be a somewhat racially tinged uh, uh, re-election campaign. And he kind of piggybacked onto the campaign for um, uh, Proposition 187, which was a voter initiative to deny um, undocumented immigrants uh, any access to any state services at all. It, it passed overwhelmingly, and Governor Wilson was uh, reelected, even though the state's economy was not doing very well. Um, although that Proposition 187 was never actually implemented, it was it was killed uh, by the courts. Um, so I, I think absolutely uh, uh, in a statewide election. Uh, you know, hot-blooded uh, social issues, cultural issues can definitely uh, be very, um, very uh, uh, prominent in a uh, in a in a statewide election. Um, your, your question went specifically to this uh, election with Snyder, and <clears throat> I think one of the things that he really tried to do throughout that that term. Uh, has, he tried to avoid those kinds of issues. He didn't want the legislature to be dragged down. He, he described them as divisive. I think he was forced into some of these things where he, he had to take a uh, position on these. Um, you know, the, the action that was taken, uh, a bill that was brought forth that uh, uh, would have denied even uh, in private insurers uh, covering abortion um, as part of their, their benefits. Uh, that was something that the legislature had passed. He vetoed it, uh, and then it was brought up by Right to Life. And, and, and in a way, as a, uh, an initiative, the, a legislative initiative that actually took it out of the hands of the governor. He couldn't veto it. So um, I think in those social issues, he, he tried to duck those things as much as he could. And so I don't think it becomes much of a burden on him that he was pushing an agenda there. Um, but uh, it's it certainly when you look at, at the sort of cuts, you look at the sort of things when they've uh, managed to, to uh, uh, work through the budget problems that they've had. You know, the governor's been promoting this, uh, there's this ad out there that says that they eliminated a billion and a half dollars budget deficit. Well, Michigan doesn't have a budget deficit, it never has. Uh, but they did have to make decisions about, you know, if you're going to cut taxes here, you're going to look at the revenues you have, you have to make cuts on things, and some of those things would end up being in, you know, things like social services and other issues like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, that makes him vulnerable, I think, with, uh, with voters, and I think there are some, you know, that, that is a factor, and it's really a matter then of will those voters get out to the polls? Will they turn out to vote in that? Uh, because you can, go, you can go back to when John Engler was running against Jim Blanchard uh, in the, uh, Blanchard was running for re-election and Engler was pretty clear about what he was gonna cut, those kinds of programs. Uh, and, uh, and yet the turnout didn't show up for Blanchard to, uh, to re-elect him and prevent that from happening. So I think it does make a difference, but it's a matter whether people will show up. So it, um it looks like uh, class is coming up for everyone. Um, so I'd like to just take the moment to thank our professors for participating in this panel. Um, I think especially in the, at the end there of the Q&A, we hit on a lot of topics that we could explore further in our Common Ground initiative. So thank you very much. Before you leave, uh, Tori and Chad have some evaluations for you. These are really valuable to us. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to fill them out. Uh, and also, I'll just take this opportunity to thank uh, Tori and Chad and everyone else at the Howenstein Center, Gleaves, Kathy, and John, for uh, helping out with this event. Um, and then finally, I think we have here, yeah, we have some uh, gifts for our panelists, uh, what we call, excuse me, we call swag bags. So, yes, yeah, so please, thank you. Oh, very much, yeah. By the way, I have my pocket copy of the Constitution. Oh, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Um, and that concludes our event. Thank you very much for coming.